Good afternoon. I'm really delighted to welcome you uh, to this Capital Science Evening. For more than a century, Carnegie researchers have been studying the cosmos, seeking to explore and really understand the mysteries of the universe. Throughout the history of Carnegie, this work has been informed by our great mission, which is to investigate, learn, and create new knowledge for the benefit of humanity. The fundamental idea that scientific discovery is and must be inextricably linked to the improvement for all of our lives is central to the work of our speaker today, the renowned astrophysicist, Lord Martin Rees. Since the 1960s, um, Lord Rees has done pioneering research on quasars, on black holes and galaxy formation. He has made many major contributions to our understanding of the Big Bang, the, or the birth of our universe, as well as the early universe. He's published seminal works on active galaxies, gamma ray bursts, the cosmic microwave background, which is a remnant of the Big Bang itself, the cosmic dark ages, and the formation of the universe large scale structure. Lord Rees is uh, an emeritus professor of cosmology and astrophysics at the University of Cambridge. His extraordinary work has won him honors from around the world. And to name a few, uh, he has been awarded the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society the Balzan Prize for High Energy Astrophysics, the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, the Institute of Physics Newton Medal, and just last year, the European Astronomical Society's Fritz Zwicky Prize for Astrophysics and Cosmology. In addition to this extraordinary work that he's done as an astrophysicist, Lord Rees is one of the co-founders of the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Now, this multidisciplinary center is dedicated to the study and the mitigation of risks that could lead to human extinction or civilizational collapse, including major impacts today like climate change. To address and to battle some of these risks, the center has seeks to foster a global community of ac academics, technologists, and policymakers to work to safeguard humanity. Lord Rees here, is here to talk with us today about his deep concerns about the future of humanity and his heartfelt belief that together we can harness technology to save humankind. And before, uh, before we start, I wanted to read one quote that, uh, that has really resonated with me and I think others. And it's science deepens our sense of mystery and wonder about the world around us, but also it allows us to change the world around us. And that's really a profound thought and, and one that all of us in science should consider, remember and act actively participate in. So now I'd like to invite Carnegie trustee, Michael Wilson, to share some personal thoughts about his good friend, Lord Rees and, and his work. Michael is a managing director of Eon Productions Limited. And this is the production company that uh, is responsible for the James Bond film series. He has co-written a number of the James Bond screenplays and has made cameo appearances in every Bond film since 1977. So you'll probably recognize him. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Michael Wilson. Michael? Uh, thank you for that, Eric. Um, Martin and I have been friends for over 25 years. We met as uh, trustees and fellows of the Science Museum. Martin is a man who wears many hats. Eric has described in detail his accomplishments as a cosmologist, and he's authored over 500 scientific papers and done fundamental research and made discoveries in most areas of modern ecology, cosmology. But I know him as someone I can call up with a question about the evolution of the universe, and in a few minutes feel satisfied that my question's been answered, at least to the level of my understanding. I also know him as the master of Trinity College, Cambridge. Master is equivalent to being the president of an American university. Trinity is the most prestigious scientific center of learning in the UK, boasting 34 novel Nobel laureates among its illustrious alumni. <clears throat> I know him as one of the most successful presidents of the Royal Society, a role that demands did all of his skills and leadership and diplomacy as every member is a scientific superstar with an opinion to match. The Royal Society is the oldest and most respected scientific organization in the world, established in 1660. The 8,000 fellows elected over the past four centuries leads, reads like a who-who of the world's leading scientists, Newton, 
Ben Franklin, Darwin, Einstein, Hawking, who, by the way, was a friend, colleague, and fellow professor with Martin at Trinity. I also know him as the 15th Astronomer Royal for Great Britain, the highest honor the government can bestow on an ast astronomer. It was a post established by Charles II when the observatory at Greenwich was built. And the position was established not to cast horoscopes, as was the norm in Europe at the time for royal astronomers, but for the scientific purpose of aiding navigation. <clears throat> Martin is a life peer, Baron Reed's Rees of Ludlow, who sits in the House of Lords as a crossbencher, which means he's independent of any political party affiliation. He's married to the lovely Catherine Humphrey, an anthropologist, fellow professor, and dame commander of the British Empire in her own right. Martin's interests are broad, not limited to science. They encompass every topic in your daily newspaper, but with greater insight. In addition to all these honors and accomplishments, Martin is a great communicator. He can explain complex ideas in simple and understandable language. And that's why we're here tonight. Martin will introduce his new book on the future prospects for humanity and will describe what our world might look like in 2050 when he and I will be 108 years old. When I read his last book on the same topic in 2004, our final century, I was more than depressed. Martin did not hold out much hope for mankind. He suggested there was a credible risk humankind would not survive the 21st century. A case for mass extinction was made, not because of an oxygen catastrophe or volcanic activity or an errant asteroid as happened in the past, but through human hubris, either by accident or design. The pandemic of last year and a half only adds credibility to such predictions. Imagine if the vector of the next pandemic were an airborne HIV type virus, which, for which in spite of 35 years of trying, we have not developed an effective vaccine, or an Ebola with a long incubation period. Well, Martin, what is in store for us? I'm pleased to present my friend, Lord Martin Rees. Good. All right. Good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen if I can. Uh, sorry, yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much for those uh, flattering words, Michael. It's a great privilege to be here. I do have the title of Stormer Royal, but I don't do the Queen's horoscopes. And I have a very cloudy crystal ball. Indeed, all scientists are rather poor forecasters, almost as bad as economists. I've nonetheless written a book entitled On the Future. But my forecast will be very tentative. The theme of the book is this. The Earth has existed for 45 million centuries. Is this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has the planet's future in its hands. We're deep in the Anthropocene. But let's first focus on two things we can predict. First, the world in 2050 will be more, more crowded. 50 years ago, world population was below 4 billion. It's now 7.8 billion. The growth has been mainly in Asia and Africa. This distorted map scales each country by the growth in the population over the last 30 years. The number of births worldwide 
is actually going down. But world population is forecast to rise to about 9 billion by mid-century. That's mainly because young people, most people in the developing world are young and they live longer. The age histogram in the developing world will become more like that in Europe on the right. All living longer. But despite doom laden forecasts in the 1960s, food production has kept pace with the doubling population since then. Famines still occur, but they're due to conflict or maldistribution, not overall scarcity. But to feed 9 billion by mid century will require further improved agriculture, water conserving, and GM crops. And maybe some dietary innovations, converting insects highly nutritious and rich in protein into palatable food and making artificial meat, no real beef. To quote Gandhi, there'll be enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Projections beyond 2050 are uncertain. Falling infant mortality, urbanization and women's education trigger the demographic transition towards lower birth rates but there could be countervailing cultural influences. If for whatever reason, families in Africa remain large, then that continent's population could double again between 2050 and 2100, raising the global population to 11 billion. And Nigeria could then have as big a population almost as Europe and North America combined. Well, optimists say that each extra mouth brings two hands and a brain. But the geopolitical stresses would be worrying. As compared to the fatalism of earlier generations, those in poor countries now know via the internet, etc., what they're missing. And migration's easier. It's a portent for disaffection and instability. Multiple mega versions of the tragic boat people crossing the Mediterranean today. So wealthy nations, especially those in Europe, should urgently instigate a mega Marshall plan for Africa, and not just for altruistic reasons. And another thing, if humanity's collective impact on land use and climate pushes too hard, the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We're destroying the book of life before we've read it. Already there's more biomass in chickens and turkeys than in all the world's wild birds. And the biomass in humans, cows and domestic animals is 20 times that in wild mammals. Biodiversity is crucial for human well-being. But preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, over and above what it means to us humans. To quote the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. So the world's getting more crowded. And the second firm prediction, it'll get warmer. In contrast to population issues, climate change is certainly not under discussed, though it is under responded to. The famous Keeling curve shows the rise in the CO2 concentration over the last 50 years. The oscillations are caused by the fact that there are more trees in the northern hemisphere than the south, and when the leaves fall off them in the autumn, they give a rise in CO2 and a fall in the spring. And the fifth IPCC report has presented a spread of projections for different assumptions about future rates of fossil fuel use. Here are four projections. It's still unclear how much the climatic effect of CO2 is amplified by other things, associated changes in water vapor and clouds. That's a further uncertainty, and that's illustrated by the length of the vertical bars on the right of this slide. Despite the uncertainties, though, there's one message that most would agree on. It's that under business as usual scenarios, we can't rule out later this century, really catastrophic warming, 
and tipping points, triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice. And we are like the proverbial boiling frog, contented in a warming tank until it's too late to save ourselves. And of course, it's nations far away from ours in the global north that will suffer most from climate change. Not everyone urges urgent action now. The Danish campaigner Born Lomberg has sort of bogeyman status among environmentalists. That's a bit unfair because he doesn't contest the science. But his Copenhagen consensus of economists does downplay the priority of addressing climate change compared to shorter term ways of helping the world's poor. But the reason for that is that he applies a standard discount rate and in effect writes off what happens beyond 2050. But if you care about those who will live into the 22nd century, then as other economists like Stern and Reitzman argue, you think it's worth paying an insurance premium now to safeguard against the worst case. Unsurprisingly, it's the young who expect to live to the end of the century whose clamor for action is loudest. Their leverage on voters and the media is amplified by charismatic individuals, especially the uh, disparate quartet of Pope Francis, David Attenborough, Bill Gates and Greta Thunberg. And the crucial meetings this year in Glasgow on climate and in China on biodiversity. But to insert a bit of good cheer, there is a win-win roadmap to a low carbon future. Nations should all accelerate R&D into all forms of low carbon energy generation and into other technologies where parallel progress is crucial. Storage, batteries, compressed air, hydrogen, etc., and smart transcontinental grids. This should enable Europe and North America to reach net zero. But there's something even more important. The faster these clean technologies advance, the sooner will their prices fall so they become affordable to the nations of the global south. And these nations can't reach acceptable living standards without generating more power than they do today. Not only will their per capita energy needs rise, unlike ours, but they will collectively harbour a billion more people by 2050. So bending the trajectory of CO2 emissions for those countries is crucial. They must be helped to leapfrog more speedily to clean energy rather than building coal-fired power stations. It will be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young engineers than devising clean and economical energy systems which can achieve net zero for the entire world. We should be evangelists for new technology. Without it, the world can't provide food, and sustainable energy for an expanding and more demanding population. But many of us are anxious that it's advancing so fast that we may not properly cope with it and that we'll have a bumpy ride through this century. Nuclear war still looms over us. The only consolation is that there are about five times fewer weapons on high alert than there were during the Cold War. But there are now nine nuclear powers and a higher chance than ever before that smaller nuclear arsenals might be used regionally or even by terrorists. And some claim that command and control systems are getting more vulnerable to cyber threats. Moreover, we can't rule out later this century the standoff between new superpowers. It could be handled less well or less luckily than the Cuba crisis was. Nuclear weapons are based on 20th century technology, but this century has brought surges in new technologies, bio, cyber, and AI. Advanced in microbiology, diagnostics, vaccines, and antibiotics offer prospects of containing COVID-19 and other natural pandemics. But the same research raises, and this is my number one nightmare, the prospect of engineered pandemics. This is the influenza virus. And 
nearly 10 years ago, groups in Wisconsin and in Holland showed it was surprisingly easy to make this virus both more virulent and more transmissible. The scary portent of things to come. Such gain of function experiments can be done in principle for coronaviruses. And the new CRISPR-Cas9 technique for gene editing is hugely promising, but there are ethical concerns about experiment on human embryos, for instance, and worries about possible runaway consequences of gene drive programs to wipe out species as diverse as mosquitoes, which carry dangerous viruses, or gray squirrels, rather nice animals which are thought to be a pest over here in England. Regulation of biotech is needed. But I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed on prudential or ethical grounds can't be enforced worldwide, any more than the drug laws can or the tax laws. Whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that is a nightmare. Whereas an atomic bomb can't be built without big special purpose facilities, biotech involves small scale dual use equipment. And the rising empowerment of tech savvy groups by biotech and by cyber tech as well will pose an intractable problem for governments and aggravate the tension between freedom and privacy and security. The global village will have its village idiots but their idiocies can now cascade globally. These concerns are fairly near term within the next 10 or 15 years. What about 2050 and beyond? On the bio front, you might expect two things. First, a better understanding of the combination of genes that determine key human characteristics and the ability to synthesize genomes which match those features. If it becomes possible for biohackers to, as it were, play God on a kitchen table, then our ecology and even our species may not long survive unscathed. And what about another transformative technology, robotics and AI? DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero computer famously beat a human champion in games of Go and chess. It was given just the rules and trained by playing a millions of games against itself in just a few hours. But the human challenger, there he is, has some advantages still. The computer used hundreds of kilowatts of power. His brain uses about 30 watts, a light bulb, and can do lots of things apart from just playing a game. But already AI, because of the ever rising processing speed shown in this familiar diagram here, can cope better than humans with complex, fast changing networks, traffic flows or electric grids. And the Chinese could have an efficient planned economy that Marx could only dream of. And AI can help science too. Understanding protein folding, drug development, and perhaps even telling us whether string theory can really describe our universe. And the implications of AI for our society are already ambivalent. If we're sentenced to a term in prison, recommended for surgery, or even given a poor credit rating, we'd expect the reasons to be accessible to us and contestable by us. If these decisions were entirely delegated to an algorithm, we'd be entitled to feel uneasy, even if we were given compelling evidence that on average, the machine made better decisions than the human it usurped. And AI systems will become more intrusive and pervasive. Records of all our movements, our health and our financial transactions will be in the cloud, managed by a multinational quasi-monopoly. The data may be used benignly for medical research, for instance, but its availability to internet companies is already shifting the balance of power from governments to globe spanning conglomerates. And there's an incipient shift in the nature of work, which has been addressed in several excellent books. Clearly machines will take over much of manufacturing and retail distribution. They can supplement, although not fully replace, 
many white collar jobs, routine legal work, accountancy, coding, medical diagnostics and surgery. In contrast, though, some skilled service sector jobs, plumbing and gardening, for instance, require non-routine interactions with the external world and they'd be much harder to automate. But to create a humane society, I think governments are going to need to vastly enhance the number of jobs and the status of jobs for those who care for the old, the young and the sick. There are currently far too few of these jobs and they're poorly paid and poorly esteemed. These jobs would be far more fulfilling than the work in call centers or Amazon warehouses, which they could replace. And that'd be a win-win situation. And the arms race between cyber criminals and those trying to defend against it is another concern that will become still more expensive and vexatious. It's of course the speed of computers, which allows them to learn on big training sets. They learn to identify dogs, cats, and human faces by crunching through millions of images, not the way babies learn. They learn to translate by reading millions of pages of multilingual text. In Europe, they're given EU documents. Their boredom thresholds infinite. But acquiring common sense won't be so easy for them. This involves observing real people in real homes or workplaces. And a machine will be centrally deprived by the slowness of real life. It's like watching trees grow is for us. And robots are still clumsier than a child in moving pieces on a real chessboard. And they can't jump from tree to tree like a squirrel or monkey. But sensor technology is advancing apace. And this leads to digression. It's always harder to forecast the speed of a change than its direction. Sometimes there's a spell of exponential progress, like the spread of IT and smartphones in the last decade or two, but then there may be an inflection or even stagnation. Two examples. From Alcock and Brown's first transatlantic flight in 1919 to the first jumbo jet commercial flight, it was 50 years. But 50 years after that, we still have the jumbo jet and Concorde came and went. And another example, it was only 12 years from Sputnik 1 in 1957 to the moon landings. And 50 years later, that's still the high point of human spaceflight. Experts are getting less optimistic now about how quickly stage five driverless cars will become acceptable. And the iPhone 20, may not be too different from the iPhone 12. But after that digression, let's now look further ahead. What if a machine develops a mind of its own? Will it stay docile or go rogue? Futuristic books by Bostrom, Tegmark and others portray a dark side where AI gets out of its box, infiltrates the internet of things and pursues goals misaligned with human interests. Some AI pundits take this seriously, but others like uh, Rodney Brooks, inventor of the Baxter robot, regard these concerns as premature and think it would be a long time before artificial intelligence will worry us more than real stupidity. But be it as it may, it's likely that society will be transformed by autonomous robots, either the jury's out or whether they be idiot savant or display Huber Human, uh, superhuman capabilities. The visionary futurologist Ray Kurzweil, he argues that once machines have surpassed human capabilities, they could themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones, leading to an intelligence explosion. In his book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, he predicted that humans would transcend biology by merging with computers. In old style spiritualist parlance, they would go over to the other side. But Kurzweil is worried that his nirvana may not happen in his lifetime. So he wants to be preserved until it's reached. 
And there is a company in Arizona that will freeze your body in liquid nitrogen and store it so that when your metal is on offer, you can, they claim, be resurrected or your brain downloaded. I was surprised to find that three academics in England had gone in for this so-called cryonics. Two paid the full whack. The third took the cut price option of just having his head frozen. I'm glad these were all from Oxford and not from my university. I told them I'd rather in my days in an English churchyard than an American refrigerator. But of course, research on aging is being seriously prioritized. Will the benefits be incremental or is aging a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension would plainly be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications. But it may happen along with human enhancement in other forms. And it's surely on the cards that human beings, their mentality and their physique may become malleable through the deployment of genetic modification and cyborg technology. Designer babies may become conceivable in both senses of the word. Moreover, this future evolution, a kind of secular intelligent design, would take only centuries. In contrast, the thousands of centuries needed for Darwinian evolution. And this would be a game changer. When we admire the literature and artifacts that have survived from antiquity, we feel an affinity across a time gulf of thousands of years with those ancient artists and their civilizations. But we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligence is a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us, even though they may have an algorithmic understanding of how we behave. And now I turn to another technology, space. It's beyond the earth in environments hostile to humans that cyborg and AI technologies have the most spectacular scope and where these changes will, I think, happen fastest and should worry us less. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by swarms of miniaturized probes, probes far more advanced than the wonderful Cassini probe designed in the 1990s, which spent 13 years exploring Saturn and its moons. Or the New Horizon probe, which transmitted amazing pictures from Pluto, 12,000 times further away than the moon. Think back to the computers and phones of the 1990s, when these probes were designed, and realize how much better we can do today. The next step will be deployment in space of robotic fabricators, which can build large structures, for instance, giant telescopes or solar energy collectors, assembled under zero gravity in space. But what about human spaceflight? The practical case for this gets ever weaker with each advance in robots and miniaturization. So will it have a resurgence? I cherish this picture signed for me a few years ago by seven Apollo astronauts. And it's nearly 50 years since Harrison Schmidt and Ed Kernan returned from the final trip to the moon of the Apollo program. Hundreds more have ventured into space subsequently, but anticlimatically, they've done no more than circle the Earth in low orbit, most in the International Space Station. They only make news when something goes wrong, when the loo fails or when they perform stunts like the Canadian Chris Hadfield playing David Bowie songs and his guitar. So will there be any inspirational Apollo star projects in future? There's no denying that NASA's perseverance will miss startling discoveries that no human geologist could overlook. But machine learning is advancing fast as is sensor technology. In contrast, the cost gap between human and robotic missions remains huge. NASA's manned program ever since Apollo has been impeded by public and private by public and political pressure into being extremely risk averse. 
the space shuttle failed twice in 135 launches. Astronauts or test pilots would willingly accept a 2% level of risk. But the shuttle had unwisely been promoted as safe for civilians. And that therefore meant that each of those uh, disasters uh, was really a sort of national trauma and held up the program. And it implies to me that because of this safety culture, NASA will confront political obstacles in achieving any grand goal within a feasible budget. In fact, were I an American, I'd strongly support NASA's robotic program. But I'd argue that all human missions should be private enterprise ventures. SpaceX and Blue Origin could operate a cut price program far riskier than Western nations could impose on publicly supported civilians. There were many volunteers, some perhaps even accepting one way tickets, driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers and the like. And the phrase space tourism should be avoided. It would lull these people into believing that these ventures are routine. And if that's the perception, the inevitable accidents would be as traumatic as those of the space shuttle were. These exploits must be sold as dangerous sports for intrepid exploration. But by 2100, some courageous thrill seekers may have established bases independent from the Earth, on Mars or maybe on asteroids. Elon Musk himself, aged 49, I think, says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. He might make it. But don't ever expect mass emigration from the Earth. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. And here I disagree with Musk and my late colleague Stephen Hawking. I think it's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from Earth's problems. Dealing with climate change on Earth is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. There's no planet B for ordinary risk averse people. Nonetheless, we should cheer on these brave space adventurers because they will have a pivotal role in spearheading the post-human future in the 22nd century and far beyond. And this is why they'll be ill-adapted to their new habitat. So they'll have a more compelling incentive than we on Earth will to redesign themselves. They'll harness the super powerful genetic and cyborg technologies that will be developed in coming decades. These techniques will one hopes be restrained here on Earth, but the settlers on Mars will be beyond the clutches of the regulators. And we should surely wish them good luck in modifying their progeny to adapt to alien environments. So it's these space faring pioneers not those of us come to be adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead the post-human era that Kurzweil envisages. I'm often asked, do astronomers bring a special perspective to global issues? Let me explain why I think they do and why it's relevant to these concerns. We are all familiar with this time chart depicting that we and our biosphere are the outcome of four billion years of Darwinian evolution. But many who fully believe this somehow think we humans are the culmination, the top of the tree. But no astronomer could believe this. That's because we know the sun is less than halfway through its life and the cosmos may have an infinite time ahead of it. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. So we may be nearer the beginning than the end of the emergence of complexity in the cosmos, which will have attributes that our brains can't conceive. Well, this raises the question I'm often asked, is the life out there, even intelligent life already? Or is the galaxy awaiting our progeny? We'd all agree we don't know. Well, not quite all, I get letters from people who say they've met the aliens, they've been abducted by the aliens, etc. I tell them, do you really think that if the aliens had made a huge effort to traverse interstellar space, they just 
talk to one or two well-known cranks, maybe make a corn circle, and then go away again. It seems unlikely. I tell these people to write to each other and not to me. But what we do know is this. We know that there's not, no space in our solar system which harbors advanced life. The red planet, planets, as we may learn in a few years, may have evidence that it once had some simple life on it. There may be creatures swimming under the ice of Enceladus, uh, a, me, a moon of uh, Saturn. But things are more encouraging for alien life if we widen our horizon to the stars. Because we've learned in the last 20 years that most stars in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the sun is. The galaxy harbors literally billions of habitable planets. The special interest in twins of our Earth, planets the same size as ours, on orbits where water can exist, neither boiling away nor staying frozen. They're being studied. There'll be huge progress in the coming decade. But of course, habitable doesn't mean inhabited. And that's the number one question. But that sadly is a topic for a different lecture or maybe the question period. So let me now conclude by coming back to Earth. Even in the context of a concertina timeline, stretching not just billions of years in the past, but as shown here, billions of years in the future, this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has our planet's future in its hands. Our creative intelligence could jumpstart the transition from an Earth-based to a space-faring species and from biological to electronic intelligence. And those transitions could inaugurate billions of post-human evolution on the Earth and far beyond. On the other hand, humans could trigger bio, cyber or environmental catastrophes that foreclose all such potentialities. But what should be our message to the younger generation? It's surely that there's no scientific impediment to achieving a sustainable world where all enjoy a lifestyle better than those in the West do today. We live under the shadow of new hazards, but these can be minimized by a culture of responsible innovation especially in fields like biotech and advanced AI. And by reprioritizing the thrust of the world's technological effort. So we can be technological optimists, but the intractable politics and sociology engender pessimism. The scenarios I've described, environmental degradation, unchecked climate change, and unintended consequences of advanced technology could trigger serious set back to our society. And our world is so interconnected that a collapse, societal or ecological, would be a truly global setback. Given the stakes, such threats shouldn't be ignored. We should be mindful of Nate Silver's maxim, the unfamiliar is not the same as the improbable. Scientists have an obligation to promote beneficial applications of their work and warn against the downsides. Universities should offer their staff's expertise and convening power to access which scary scenarios, exothreats, etc., should be dismissed as science fiction and how best to avoid the serious ones. And as mentioned in the introduction, we in Cambridge set up a centre where we now have 20 or 25 people addressing just these issues. And most of the challenges are indeed global. COVID-19 plainly is, and the threat to potential shortages of food, water and natural resources can't be solved by each nation separately, nor can the regulation of threatening innovations. Indeed, the key issue is whether in a new world order, nations need to give up more sovereignty to new organizations along the lines of the International Atomic Energy Agency, World Health Organization, etc. And I'll end with a flashback right back to the Middle Ages. For medieval people, the entire cosmology from creation to apocalypse spanned only a few thousand years. They were bewildered and helpless in the face of floods and pestilences and prone to irrational dreads. Large part of the earth were terra incognita, but they built cathedrals. This Ely Cathedral 
10 miles from where I live. They're constructed with primitive technology by masons who knew they wouldn't live to see them finished. Vast and glorious buildings that still inspire us centuries later. Well, our horizons in space and time are now vastly extended, as are our resources and knowledge. But we don't plan centuries ahead. This seems a paradox, but there is a reason. Medieval lives played out against a backdrop which changed little from one generation to the next. They were confident they'd have grandchildren who would appreciate the Finnish cathedral. But for us, unlike for them, the next century could be drastically different from the present one. We can't foresee it, so it's harder to plan for it. There's now a huge disjunction between the ever shortening time scale of social and technical change and the billionaire time spans of biology, geology, and cosmology. So spaceship Earth is hurtling through the void. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. Their life support system is vulnerable to disruption and breakdown. There's too little planning, too little horizon scanning. What we need is to think globally, to think rationally, and to think long-term. We need to be good ancestors, empowered by 21st century technology, but guided by values that science itself can't provide. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Martin, for a, a terrific, a terrific uh, a talk. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. Uh, I'll try to encapsulate Good. some of them. Uh, right, can the, I, questions? Uh, Sorry? I'm just going to try and uh, unshare yeah. my screen if I can, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, there okay. You go. Um, right. Um, so there, there are questions that go from very short time scales to very long time scales. So let's start with um, something on a shorter time scale. Right. Um, actually, we have um, one of our radio stations, WTOP, one of the science reporters, Greg Redfern is on, and he, he asked the question, which is, I guess you could say more on the uh, pessimistic side, which yeah, is how, you know, how can civil, how, if you think about how civilization, not, not necessarily the human animal, the individual, but how civilization will be able to survive and thrive not necessarily till 2050, but for the next five years, given <laughs> all that's going on, uh, basically asking for your prognosis. This is, you know, it should be easy to predict five years in the future. We're not asking you for a hundred now. So what do you think can happen on the short term that can sort of uh, correct where we're headed? I think many people agree we're not going in the right direction. Well, I mean, the downside is that we are uh, interconnected. Um, so uh, we can't recover unless the rest of the, the world recovers. We've learned lessons, incidentally, that we need to be uh, uh, more resilient um, rather than efficient. We need to have not just one supply chain where one broken link is important, and yeah. we need to have spare capacity, etc. cetera. Um, so I think we'll have a bumpy ride, but I don't see that we will have a catastrophe. But I think COVID-19 is a real wake-up call because, um, as Michael said at the beginning, uh, we could have um, viruses far more lethal than COVID-19 has proved to be, and we can't let them with them. Yeah, I mean, actually that, that brings up another question since you mentioned COVID-19, I'm not surprised it's come up a few times. Right. Are there lessons that you think we can learn from the last year? I mean, you mentioned how profound the science was, but also how bioengineering could result in even a worse pandemic. Really? But are there lessons about the response of the whole globe to the pandemic that you think apply to some of your concerns here? Well, I think we've learned that uh, we should have prepared more. I mean, uh, um, uh, we couldn't predict when it would happen, but no one could have said it was a very unlikely event because we'd had uh, MERS and SARS, coronaviruses, um, uh, within the last 20 years, uh, which fortunately haven't spread catastrophically. Um, and uh, uh, we knew that there had been uh, uh, influenza pandemics in the past, so we should have prepared. And now that we know that over the next few years, COVID-19 will cost the world more than $20 trillion, yeah. as well as killing millions. Um, yeah. We know it will be worth spending far more, be more prepared. And um, as I mentioned, we should learn to be more resilient, um, even though it's less efficient. We should uh, not depend on just the time delivery. We should, keep, uh, uh, we, should, we should keep an inventory of stock. Uh, we should keep uh, some lots of spare beds in our hospitals as the Germans did. But yeah. other countries, yeah. it's not so I think we've learned we should be preparing, and it's worth paying quite a big insurance premium, as it were, because yeah. these events 
aren't all that unlikely. Right. You know, one of the things that seems to me a little counter to this idea that we should be preparing is you, you mentioned it in your book, which is I think currently on the order of 50 plus percent of humanity lives in cities. And that number is expected by 2050 to go to 70 percent. So if we're at nine billion people, we're talking about six billion in cities, which seems to have the, the more deleterious effect that when there are pandemics, they're going to spread very quickly. Um, what, what's your thought about, about, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, you mentioned population pressure. This is really going to be one of the big problems of our, our next hundred years. Well, I think so. Uh, we've got to have intensive food production to get to them. But I think yeah. uh, one, one point I made in my book, actually, was um, that uh, whereas in the 14th century, um, the Black Death killed half the population of some towns and cities, towns and villages, but the other half went on fatalistically. They were self-sufficient, etc. Um, yeah. I said in my book that if we had one percent um, fatality rates, there'd be social breakdown because of yeah. overwhelming hospitals. Now, what we've had in Europe and the United States is about 0.3 percent. So yeah. I think um, uh, that that's a, a warning. That uh, a scary one. could be yeah. breakdown yeah. Um, yeah. for something which is not nearly as bad as a black death. Yeah. So since we're talking about scale, nine billion is a big number. Uh, you you ended your talk talking about spaceflight, and I think some of the entrepreneurs and futurists today say, well, the solution is to find more places for humanity to live, right? So the moon, Mars, and you mentioned that asteroids. Yes. Um, yes. My question is, you know, right now, of course, our travel to Mars. Uh, you mentioned perseverance is an important research topic and yes, exciting. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Nobody's been there yet, and only a handful have been to to the moon. So, and you said, let's not call it tourism, because I, I agree, it's not tourism, but is it, you think it's really believable that we could scale it to the point where population and resources, obviously things like natural resources, can be expanded by moving off the earth to other planets, or are we just not being imagined enough, or is it possible, I guess well, is well, the question. Let's say two separate things. I mean, yeah. uh, um, maybe there's lots of uh, uh, alien life out there already, but if yeah. there isn't, it's certainly possible that post-human species may be descended from the crazy Martians, uh, as it were, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, will, will um, if they become electronic, then they'll be near immortal, interstellar yeah. voyages lasting a million years won't daunt them, and so they can spread through the galaxy. So uh, there can be a, a spread of intelligence, as it were, of that kind, which in a sense was triggered by the flesh and blood civilization on Earth today. I think that's good. But I think to actually um, talk about um, um, getting our surface population off the earth, that doesn't make any sense. I think we no. can, surely we can cope with our, our population. And indeed, um, it's not at all clear whether after 2050, the population will rise or, or fall. Um, uh, I gave a scenario saying um, one UN projection says it will rise, but there are other projections that say it may start to fall again, and it is falling yeah. in uh, yeah. most of Europe. Um, so I think the, the the idea of a sort of exponential growth of population taking over more and more planets is very unrealistic. <laughs> yeah. But, but we, we've got to decide what's the optimum population on the Earth, which is probably about 3 billion or something like that. Yeah, so that question did come up too, right? What do you think that the population should go up or down? I think you did, it's a politically loaded question, but you yeah, did just yeah. answer it. You said it should well, go I mean, down. I, I think um, uh, with a population of even 9 billion, we could provide um, um, a decent life for all 9 billion if we uh, uh, went for greater equality and all that. But um, at the other extreme, I mean, if everyone wants to have a nice beachfront property, you can't have more than a few million. Uh, and between that, there are all kinds of... Uh, uh, options but uh, i would guess that um, probably the ideal would be something like three billion but uh, but but we can cope with nine billion yeah well that okay nine billion so that's the number we should shoot for yeah. <clears throat> um you know there were some other interesting questions about uh the, the future economies so i know you're an astrophysicist but i'm sure you've thought about economics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And coming, it's actually related to this question of, of managing our own natural resources. Uh, yes. every, you know, think about electrification of vehicles and needing enough lithium or, you know, or enough uh, clean water, et cetera, all the important mm -hmm. things we're worried about. So do you think the future, um, and maybe you'll have to turn to some of your colleagues who are economists, but the yes, future yes. Is, is supply chain limited or is it more resource limited? In other words, are there ways to think about the future? Is, are there enough resources on earth with say 9 billion? That was the number you said. 
uh, to supply everybody. And I think you said yes, but I just wanted to hear you say that again. Mm -hmm. But or or do you think it's a resource limitation? Do we have to get better at manufacturing, or do we have to get better at at finding resources and reusing resources, or is it both? Well, I can't comment on particular rare earths, but I think yeah. in general I would say that um, uh, you know we can get all our energy um, in a renewable way and, uh, and and store it via hydrogen and all the rest. So I think we can provide energy in a sustainable way, and certainly we can provide food in a sustainable yeah. way. Yeah. Um, uh, without even having artificial meat and all that. So I, I think I don't think there's any particular problem of that kind. Um, but I think uh, we want to have a stable um, uh, world uh, that's, that's not being disrupted all the time. And I think that does require ensuring that Africa doesn't fall behind. Yeah, um, yeah. And also, um, uh, I'd have thought, less inequality within countries as well as between countries. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. I mean, some of the things you raised, you know, you talked about all these, I would call them, so we talked about population and, and, and climate, but you also mentioned all these sort of dual use technologies, right? Whether it was uh, computing or whether it was, you know, biotechnology, which could be used for the good, the betterment or, you know, or the, the detriment to, to humankind. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, and the, the questions that keep coming up is how do you manage that on a global scale? How do you think about, you know, each country seems to be very competitive. So you've got, you know, in a healthy mm -hmm. ways that are very competitive, you know, EU, US, yeah. China, Asia, et cetera. But how do you mm -hmm. think about, uh, you know, you, you've talked a number of times about global agreement or global consensus yeah. on some, the use of these. Um, how, how do you, even get your head around something like that, yes. especially given yeah. the competition. Well, so. we certainly need stronger international bodies because uh, even individual companies are international conglomerates, yeah. not under any uh, jurisdiction. So, so we need that. Um, but uh, I do worry very much about um, the fact that um, dangerous biotech and cyber attacks can be done by um, uh, even a few people or one person yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, uh, familiar equipment it, uh, and uh, without um, abandoning privacy completely and watching everyone all the time yeah. it's very hard to be sure that things like that can't happen but I think as I said there's a trade-off between privacy security and liberty and yeah. different nations will uh, have the balance differently I mean the Chinese may give up privacy more willingly than the rest of us uh, yeah. but that'll make them more secure I think there's a genuine trade-off and so I I don't see any easy answer to that one. Yeah, uh, but talking about these risks, uh, I'll ask two more questions because I think we're getting close to the top of the hour now, and it's pretty late for you <laughs> in the UK. Yeah, really but um, what you know, one question came up. So you know, we talked about climate. You talked about climate, water, food, energy, all the the sort of the things that are necessary for life and threatened at some level. But and these are all sort of the likely risks. But are there is there any unlikely risk that you haven't talked about? I mean, things like uh, really sort of H spike events, unusual events that, that may be very low risk, but very high uh, potential for, for impact uh, on earth that you would, that you think about and worry about in your center. Yes, well, two kinds. of course I'm an astronomer, people think I worry about asteroids. And yeah. of course they're, they're a risk that we can uh, quantify. We know enough about asteroids, et cetera. We, we know what those problems are. Uh, we can uh, deal with modest sized ones, but not the big ones, but it's a fairly small risk. And it's not getting any bigger. The risks yeah. that are really threatening are those caused by humans. And yeah. They're the ones getting bigger year by year. Um, so there, um, but this, there is another class which um, um, one has to worry a bit about. And that's, um, um, you know, some, some uh, uh, completely unexpected um, catastrophe caused by experimenting in unknown parameter space, as it were, you know. Um, yeah. uh, well, the, the classic example people quote is uh, uh, in a high accelerator, can you, will something yeah, happen? Yeah. Very yeah. unlikely, but you can't absolutely say it's impossible. Um, and, and ditto, making some pathogen, um, uh, which uh, could be a byproduct of uh, what's done in, in, in some lab, it could have some completely catastrophic consequences. So I think we've got to, yeah. uh, to some extent, apply a precautionary principle. We can't be over, of course, Neil, because that, that means we don't get anything new. But we do have to worry a bit uh, yeah. when we're doing something in a domain that's never been explored before and has never happened naturally. 
Yeah. I remember when they turned on the CERN machine and everybody was worried about the implosion of the of the earth. Yeah. Instead, we just we discovered the Higgs, which was pretty good. Well, pretty pretty yeah. good trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it yeah. wasn't stupid to ask. It was quite No, 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 it wasn't. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but if, you know, so I wrote a paper saying that they shouldn't worry because in fact collisions like that had happened uh, yeah. uh, in the universe with cosmic rays. So it hasn't yeah. happened before. Well. Lord, we could go on all night, but I have just uh, two related personal questions that came up, yes. which I think are nice to ask. The first is, you've won so many prizes. I guess 25 was the number. Do you put these all in your home? Where uh, do you have them? Do you have enough room for um, all the uh, words you want? Well, there's a, a cupboard under the stairs that's got some things like that. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, but no, more serious question, which I think is important, which is how confident are you that be enough future Lord Reese's who have your level of awe and excitement about science and will continue the kind of discovery that you have applied for your whole career. Uh, you know, are you confident that there are enough scientists coming up in the world who, who can do what you've done? I think, Don, and I think the um, as science advances, the frontier gets longer and more exciting. And uh, in astronomy, um, of course, it's been very exciting for the last 50 years, but um, I think exoplanets, which are a new, yeah. new field, in fact, my uh, my Cambridge colleague Didier Kello got a Nobel Prize last year for co-discovering the first one 25 years ago. He's discovered hundreds more since, and that's a huge new field. And so I think uh, there's plenty of excitement. But I think more seriously, um, we do have to ensure that scientific careers remain attractive. Um, yeah. I think many people would say, and you know, at least as well as me, that uh, in universities there's more bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got to make sure that uh, um, uh, it's not just the uh, ultra nerds who go into academia. We we want to get yeah. a few people of flexible talent yeah. Yeah, who yeah. do other things, uh, but who choose to go in. And of course, one one thing that's that's got, got worse is prom promotion is slower. Fifty years ago, the young outnumbered the old, and promotion was quick. Whereas now, uh, I know in the US there was a committee which reported a few years ago that people get their first grant from the NIH when they're 42 years old. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and yeah. Uh, if people know that that's the situation, then they'll go and uh, uh, have a startup because people want to do something by yeah. the time they're 30. Yeah. If they can't do that in academia, then they won't go yeah. into university. No, I, I think it's clear that a lot of... opportunities for young people yeah. to make an impact yeah. quickly. I think it's clear that, uh, that all of our governments need to think carefully about how to invest in science to make it a, a yeah. very desirable career. For, yeah. for young scientists, you know, of, of all mm -hmm. genders, all races, and mm -hmm. the diversity angle is very important here too. But I do think investment in it, knowing that you can make a career that's that's uh, that's that's exciting yes. out of science yes. is very important. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I can we can end that on an upbeat note mm -hmm. where where the future is bright because we're going to have more and more scientists like you, and <laughs> uh, and you know, unfortunately, we had many many more questions which we can't get to. But I would like to thank, uh, once again, thank uh, Lord Martin Reese for a wonderful presentation, for staying up late with us and and mm -hmm. uh, and answering these questions in such a, a skillful way. So thank you very much. And mm -hmm. we'll hope to see you again soon at Carnegie. Yes. Thank you, Eric, for the invitation. Privileged to be with you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. All right.